Bridges are a vital component of our transportation infrastructure, and they play a critical role in connecting both communities and also facilitating commerce. However, designing and constructing a bridge is a complex and challenging task that requires a deep understanding of many different engineering disciplines, including that of geotechnical engineering. For that reason, in today's episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast, we'll be talking with Arsenius Gerges, PE. He's a lead geotechnical bridge engineer from Hardesty and Hanover LLP, also known as h and We'll be talking about the role of geotechnical engineering in bridge design and construction, and we'll also discuss the various environmental factors that geotechnical engineers must consider and the maintenance requirements for different types of bridges and how they impact their lifespan. I'm your host, Jared Green, and I'm excited to be bringing you another episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast. But before we get started, here's a quick word from our sponsor for today's episode, that being Keller. Welcome to the show, Arsenius. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Jared. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for carving out some time to be here. Uh, really looking forward to our conversation. I'm glad you could be here with us. Thank you for having us. Having me, Jared. Appreciate it. Excellent. Excellent. Well, it would be great if you could tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself, uh, career journey, and then again, what is it that you do on a daily basis at h and Sure. So um, I've been with h and for 11 years now. Um, it's the only, only firm I've actually been uh, employed with uh, ever since I graduated. I did graduate from NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology, with my bachelor's in civil engineering, and I actually stayed there for my uh, master's as well. I got my uh, bachelor's of engineering, uh, specialty in geotechnical engineering with NJIT. My day-to-day at h and um, I am part of a, a 13-person group, geotechnical group here. Um, I do manage five of them in New York, so I lead New York City geotechnical group. Uh, my day-to-day is, a lot of it is designing uh, foundations. That's really our bread and butter that we do here at h and Geotech. So a lot of it is design. We do subsurface exploration as well. We do supervise them. We build out the programs and so forth. And we also are heavily involved during the construction support services. Okay. Yeah. Got it, got it, got it. And, um, you know, it's interesting. When, when I talk about civil engineering, most time yeah. I talk about civil engineering, people think about bridges almost like immediately right um mm. but oftentimes i talk to geotechnical engineers people think about like buildings so mm. curious to hear what what makes geotechnical engineering for bridges unique like what are some of the things that you're tackling that are unique for for bridges I know well i can tell you is. one thing that certainly differentiates geotechnical engineering for bridges versus buildings for example a lot of our times our bridges are are, are going over waterways so we're we're battling with different um, different things there. For for example, um, the construction of our foundations differ from those uh, you know for buildings. Also, another thing we need to con- account for for our design is is scour. Um, when we have a hurricane, a large storm surge, um, a lot of sediments can be carried away, and that can undermine our, our bridge. And that's actually one of the leading causes for bridge failures is, is scour. So that's that's a a very important aspect in our design is considering scour, and typically the scour is 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 uh, developed by our hydraulic engineers. They have models that model a hundred year flood event, a five hundred year flood event, and they estimate what that um, scour depth will be for each of those events. And ASHA does provide guidance for you know what you should design for for a hundred year event or a five hundred year event. For example, a hundred year event, your bridge should be completely serviceable, no issues, no damage. For 500 year, it should be it should survive it. 
um, but there could be, you know, some some repairable damage. Got it. Got it. All right. Thank you. And what are some of the different types of bridge structures? And I guess you could look at it from the standpoint of uh, the advantages and, and disadvantages for these different structures. So I like to split this category up in two, fixed mm -hmm. bridges and movable bridges. Uh, I didn't make it clear earlier. H and H we're known for movable bridges. That's what we're, that's our, it's our niche. Uh, we've been doing it over, for over a hundred years. Um, we've done a lot of the first movable bridges in the country was designed by H and H. But again, I like to split this category up by fixed bridges and movable bridges. Um, mm -hmm. so some of the fixed, fixed bridges types are, you know, you have your, your typical beam bridge. Um, you have an arch bridge, suspension bridges, uh, tied, tied back, uh, tied arch bridge, um, cable stay bridges and so forth. Um, some of the disadvantages, some of the advantages for like the suspension bridges I mentioned, which are like cable stay bridge and um, a tight arch bridge, they do they do allow for very long spans. So like the George Washington Bridge, the classic um, Golden Gate Bridge is a suspension bridge, and those are very long span bridges. Um, only disadvantage is, is that they're they're very expensive to construct. Mm -hmm. And uh, the maintenance is also very, it's very, it's, it's, it's a specialty and they're also more, more pricey to, to, for maintenance. And um, they also have to consider like specific, like loading conditions or, or situations like wind is a huge factor for these long suspension bridges. They really have to account for, for those types of bridges. I mentioned arch bridges as well. Um, those are kind of the old, older style um, advantages. They, they look prettier. Um, in New York State, I can tell you, you know, a lot of times we have to follow SHPO. It's the State Pre uh, state Historic Preservation Office has input on how, you know, in, any historic bridges, they may sometimes want to maintain those. And a lot of them are actually a lot of arch bridges. So um, disadvantage to those, though, are they're very heavy to found it, and, it, and it does induce a lot of load on the foundation. Movable bridges, there's a few. I'm just going to name a few. There's, there's a lot of, like, um, subsets of them. Uh, you have your bascule bridge. Uh, ones that um, have a hinge and open up from the hinge position upwards. You have a vertical lift bridge and um, your uh, swing bridge. Those are like probably the three main ones. And there's probably subsets beneath those. For each have its advantages and disadvantages. Your bascule bridge, um, the good thing about those is that it, it has pretty much unlimited head clearance. Um, you can, once those are opened and you go directly through, you can, you know, there's no, there's no limit. Um, the only issue is that when they're in the open position, they are subject to like high wind loads. So that's something, you know, you would need to design for. And also these bascule bridges, they have a counterweight. So these counterweights have to go into a bascule pit, they call it. Um, and, and you know, that involves either, you know, having a large excavation, a coffer dam and, and so forth. So that can be challenging in certain um, site conditions. Um, vertical lift bridge. Um, uh, you know, that's just, again, a simply a, in its name. The roadway lift has four towers, uses hydraulic jacks to, to lift the bridge up above grade uh, up to allow um, any any vessels to pass through. And um, those have obviously a restricted headroom limit. So that, that's a disadvantage with that. Um, the nice thing about those, though, is that all the equipment is above water level. So um, no need to do any extra work to protect it from any water damage or have any waterproofing or any of that. They typically have all the housing and everything above, above roadway level. Um, but again, one of the disadvantages is, is the high clearance. And another one is the swing span. And swing span is where it rotates uh, um, laterally and, and plan it would rotate like a, you know, uh, like a gear almost. Um, one of our famous bridges that we did was the Willis Avenue Bridge in Manhattan. That's, mm -hmm. that's an H&H &H bridge. Um, and, you know, disadvantage for those, I'm going to speak about that first, is that it does take a little bit longer to open than it would for like a vascular vertical bridge. The vessels that need to pass through need to be at a further distance away to allow for that for that swing to occur before passing through. Um, but, you know, some owners do like it because, it, it you know, there's nothing that's open or that can obstruct anybody's view or, you know, it, it's everything is at the same level and occurs at the same level. Uh, you don't have to design for any special wind loads, uh, wind load occurrences and so forth. So oh, that's great. Thank you so much for, um, for walking us through that. Now, um, yeah. when you're working on a project, let's say you're responding to uh, an RFP request for proposal and mm -hmm. you're putting together your submission, are they typically saying what type of movable bridge is desired or, or suggested or required, or is that something that 
um, that, that you all would come up with? And I'm sure it depends, but just generally speaking, what, how does that work out? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So all these, all the move bridges we've worked so on so far have been like designed to build hmm. deliver, yeah, delivery methods. Um, so the conventional method of delivering projects. And um, we would work with the client from the get of the project to determine what type of movable bridge. And we would, as the engineer, as the owner's engineer, uh, we would offer, you know, a few of them that uh, that make sense off the bet, you know, vetting uh, whatever movable bridge has worked for the site uh -huh. um, and, and offer their disadvantages and advantages and also estimated cost for each to allow the owner to to select. And there's there's also a lot of stakeholders involved usually in this decision, like I mentioned earlier, SHPO would be one of them possibly if it is an historic site um, and any other stakeholders that, that may be involved depending on the agency you're working for. So it's it's not called out from the beginning of the project. It's something that's worked with the client. Got it, got it. And how does seismic activity impact bridge design and construction? And say this, just thinking about the earthquake that just, Literally just happened uh, yesterday. Yeah, in Turkey. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. That was devastating. Yeah. I think like 2,200 people passed in, in, a, in a collapse. Insane. Yeah. Insane. Thoughts and prayers for those, you know, Absolutely. involved. But but how does this, how does seismic activity play play into what you're talking about here? So, I'm going to speak from the region that we live in, mm -hmm. Northeast, because um, I think everybody knows in California it's a completely different animal. Yeah, you're dealing with a lot larger seismic loads. And that that a lot of times is probably going to govern over there. Mm -hmm. But you'll find here it's sometimes not the governing limit state uh, okay. for the design of the foundations and, and the entire entire structure itself. Um, so I can tell you for New York State, they classify bridges as either essential or critical. OK, mm -hmm. so and basically critical are, are for roadways that are uh, essential arteries for Say, for example, there's a catastrophic event, say there's a, a major earthquake that happened or something or a major hurricane and there had to be there, people had to flee. Um, there's critical arteries for people to flee and, and whatever bridges are within those arteries, major arteries would be classified as critical. And they're designed to a different standard than than other bridges uh, like essential. Um, so for critical bridges, we would have to design for the 2500 year event earthquake. Um, it would have to just you know, sustain the loads. It could have repairable damage, but it needs to sustain a 2,500 year earthquake. And then, but also be designed for a thousand year earthquake without any damage. While essential bridges, you know, these may be just bridges in Manhattan that, you know, are overpasses, um, some city streets, um, and, and, and you know, they're not like the GWB, they're not the Belt Parkway, they're not the Verrazano, those, those would be classified as critical. They're just, you know, maybe inner city streets or bridges, those would be classified as probably essential bridges. And those would have a different standard to design against for, for seismic. But another thing, you know, again, we have to be careful for uh, when designing for seismic is how it affects construction. You mentioned how it affects design and construction. Mm -hmm. I could tell you there's, you know, been a lot of back and forth between the geotech engineers and the structure engineers when we're, uh, for example, designing a drill shaft um, and it's reinforcing cage. Um, a lot of times the reinforcing cage for a drill shaft is governed by the seismic design. But what happens is, is that the cage gets too congested. And that's always a concern for the geotech from a constructability standpoint, because a lot of these drill shafts in this area, they're, they're constructed underwater and um, uh, they're, they're constructed, the concrete is poured via tremi, and we need the tremi, the concrete, to flow through the cage without being obstructed. Um, if they're too congested and the, the space in between the, the shear or the longitudinal reinforcement is, is uh, too close, that, that can be a problem. All right, cool. And, you know, you said that earthquakes are not usually the, the governing limit state. What, what is typically the governing limit state? And I guess it depends on the action of the bridge as well, like if it's vertical versus um, yeah. when it's down. But what, what are some of the things that, that come into play there? Yeah, so... Typically, it's the strength limit state that we found to be the governing. It's not the serviceability one okay. uh, limit state. It's typically the strength. Um, but yes, for unique bridges, such as mool bridges, mm -hmm. there could be situations, like you mentioned, for a bascule bridge, if it has a very long span, that in the open position, that the that will be the governing state for the bascule pier. Got it, got it, got it. All right, cool. And, and you know, what are you thinking, you know, what, what are folks in your team and just engineers in general, how, how are you considering the impacts of climate change, 
in sea level rise on bridge design and construction? So I'm going to speak about this slightly. It, it's, I think the conversation has started mm -hmm. about how climate change is affecting, you know, um, how we should design our bridges and what um, codes and standards we should be designing. Mm -hmm. um, but as an engineer, uh, we're, you know, we still follow the current code, the latest code. Um, you know, ASHTO for, for bridges is what we follow. Um, and a lot of times the client will have their own regional design manuals that you will need to follow. So we're, we're held to that as a minimum. There could be, you know, particular, there could be, you know, bridges that are, are much larger, that have a, a longer a design life, that are a lot more critical to the client. Well, they'll have, you know, outside of those design codes, design manuals, design guidelines, they'll have specific requirements of what they want. Uh, like, you know, the 500 year um, sea level rise may be at X in the design manual, but they may want you to design to you know, plus two above that uh, for a critical bridge, for example. It. Um, but it's, it's in the, you know, the conversation started. I, I remember I actually attended a conference uh, a few years back and it was the first time actually somebody gave a presentation. I believe it was for um, ASC, an ASCE geotech conference. Okay. Uh, and, and there was a presentation about climate change and how it should, you know, how it impacts, you know, future design. Um, got, it, got it. All right, cool. Well, I know there's been a lot of focus on, on infrastructure and, um, you know, we see that some existing bridges are selected for rehabilitation or, or mm -hmm. retrofitting and some are looked at to be replaced, but, you know, curious if you could talk a little bit more about, you know, the selection of these bridges and, you know, what are some of the challenges with evaluating existing foundations to determine whether or not something should be rehabilitated, retrofitted, or replaced? What, what, what are your thoughts there? Yeah. So um, all the bridges uh, that usually go under a, a biannual um, inspection, H&H uh, &H actually has a bridge inspection team here. Mm -hmm. That's part of the, part of the, part of the team. And um, they, they, they get awarded a lot of these bridge inspection jobs and it's usually a biannual contract. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of these bridges are, are typically uh, categorized, whether it's critical, it needs it needs attention right away, or, you know, there's some critical members that need attention, or this entire bridge is, you know, it's, something needs to happen. And they're obviously, you know, so all these bridges do go under a biannual inspection, and they get categorized accordingly. And it's the client who really does the, the, the um, categorization of or prioritization of which which bridges, you know, need to be addressed. So it's it's really the it's it's really on the client's end of of selecting which bridges need to be uh, rehabilitated or replaced. So when this bridge is the with bridge is selected, um, so typically how the RFP goes out is that the the client will not just say this is a replacement. Again, these are for design bid build. Uh, <laughs> this is not a replacement bridge or a rehabilitated bridge. They keep it open ended. They want the engineer to evaluate. You know, could we could we rehabilitate this with you know, minimal cost and, and have a, a service life of an extra 50 years, or is it not worth it? And we need to do a complete replacement because a rehabilitation will cost almost as much as your replacement. Um, so they, they leave that open-ended and the, it, it's up to the engineer to, to walk the client through that. So the engineer would do an analysis of the, you know, they'll collect all the inspection data. Um, they'll determine, okay, for a 50 year design life, you know, we need to maybe, you know, uh, replace the superstructure only, replace the bearings, um, the columns need to be patched because they're spalling in the concrete, X, Y, Z, et cetera. And they'll give a cost associated with that. At the same time, this is all preliminary design or like conceptual feasibility level um, mm -hmm. design. Um, at the same time, they'll do a very conceptual level replacement. Uh, and, I, you know, typically replacement is, is a lot more efficient than how they designed back then. So you have less spans and so forth, lighter material and less foundations and so forth. But anyway, they would do a conceptual level design for the for a replacement option and also give an associated cost. Um, so the, the uh, and also we also do a life cycle cost for each of those options. And we present that to the client. We do give a recommended, but at the end of the day, it is the client's choice. Uh, based on the budget that they have um, uh, and, and, and their discretion, they decide, okay, we want to replace this bridge or we want to rehab. It. So for rehabilitated bridges, um, a lot of times the foundations are reused. They're either reused completely without any retrofit, without any strengthening, or they're 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 um, um, you know reused with with strengthen if needed. But evaluating these existing foundations it, it, it's a real challenge. 
Yeah. Um, the, the issue is, is having limited information about them. Um, a lot of these bridges are over 75 years old. A lot, and that's typically a lot. All the bridges are designed for a 75 year design life. So those bridges that need to be rehabbed or replaced are typically at that age. And um, they just I, they didn't do a good job back then to record or keep and document all the um, whether it's it's the as built information or just the design information itself. It was either lost in translation over the years. They just don't have the information. So a lot of times we're dealing with what they call unknown foundations which is a real challenge. Um, at a minimum, we'd like to know the pile configuration, what type of pile. Uh, I found, or, you know, we do get that a lot. If we're lucky, we'll have a note in the plans giving us the allowable capacity of the pile so we can work with that. Um, but sometimes we don't have any of that. Sometimes we, we have, you know, just a pile, you know, there's a pile cap here. We know it's here because we can see it by observation. Mm -hmm. So to investigate those, there's, there's a lot of means. So during, you know, the, that that phase we can do a lot of um, field tests or field field studies, excavation to expose the pile to determine you know what type of pile, estimate hey maybe how many piles. We can also do geophysical testing. We've done in the past to estimate the pile tip, so um, it's it's done within a borehole. It's called parallel seismic logging, and we're able to um, do geophysical testing to determine the pile tip. We also do borings ourselves because a lot of the borings that were done in the region are not done with standard methods mm -hmm. so if we have the pile tip the pile type we can typically reverse engineer okay what's the approximate pile capacity for example um so th that's information we gather um if we have no information at all and we can't obtain anything you know we'd have to let the client know of these risks mm -hmm. and if they want to completely you know not touch the foundations then you know we would urge them if we're going to do any rehab or retrofitting, we, we don't want to increase the loads. We want to have, to, you know, honestly, encourage them to have lesser loads. So go with lighter weight deck, which would cost a little bit more money, and um, and do anything we can lessen the loads or make the loads at least equal to what they are. Excellent. Thank you so much. Very thorough, and uh, it, it all makes sense. <laughs> it all makes okay. sense. I'm happy. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, love to hear more about a project that you may have worked on that um, had a major impact on your career. I'm not going to name the, the project, um, mm -hmm. but I can tell you that when I first became a lead in my, my lead role here at H&H, &H, which was in 2016, mm -hmm. I was tasked with a project that was in construction. Um, it was in Harlem. I can, I can say that it was a, um, the foundation type was drill shaft. Mm -hmm. um, these are like drill shaft vents, so drill shafts that were directly connected to the to the uh, pier to the bridge columns. There's mm -hmm. no pile cap, um, and uh, the contractor was having a very bizarre anomaly occurring with all their drill shafts, mm -hmm. um, where there was after the the concrete was being poured, they observed um, bubbling in the concrete. Uh, so basically, the concrete was poured, and there was bubbling that would occur for one to two, three days until the concrete completely occurred, like air basically escaping from somewhere within the drill shaft up and, and, and manifesting at its surface. Mm -hmm. And and for drill shaft quality assurance, quality control, we, we always implement a, a uh, something called cross hole uh, sonic logging. Mm -hmm. And and what that is, it's, it's also a type of geophysical testing method. But um, what, that, what that is, is within the reinforcing cage, there's access tubes that are installed with the reinforcing cage for the drill shaft and um, probes are sent down these access tubes to evaluate the, the condition of the concrete after it's poured to make sure it's sound concrete. So together with the observed bubbling and the, the, the CSL results, which came out to be questionable, the, the CSL results didn't show, you know, we, we had completely poor concrete. It showed that it had questionable concrete. So it was uncertain of how it was. Um, and we didn't really know the concern or reason why. So there was a lot of contention because this was a high profile job. And um, there was just these issues that were related to geotech um, occurring. And it was my, my real first, you know, uh -huh. time leading a project, you know, also leading a group. So there was a, a lot of pressure on me. I mean, I, we, we're still, I'm, I was still under, we're still one group here at H&H, &H, 13 of us. So I still had access obviously to our, our chief geotechnical engineer and also our department head. To, to help walk me through this, they're, they're great individuals that helped me. But um, still, I was the face. I was the one there in the meetings, and 
it really it really made me grow up really quickly yeah and and that's the i feel like that's the only way you grow up you gotta be you gotta be put in the fire you have to you have to get in there get your hands dirty and um and and you know be in a room where the contractor's yelling and 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 things are going sideways and 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 and, and try to solve the problem i mean and just by that situation happening i've learned so much about drilled shaft construction everything because i was forced to yeah. Um, and sometimes that's what it takes for us to just become experts at something because, you know, you, you just, you're, you're forced to, to read all these different papers, publications about this one specific thing, and you actually become an expert at it. Um, and then I also learned how to, you know, it was a very, I had a very, it was a very anxious time for me. I mean, yeah. I, it was a lot, <laughs> it was a lot to deal with at the time. And, um, I, I didn't. You know, I don't think I had the skills at, at the time when I first started to, to handle that. But um, mm-hmm. through a lot of coaching, um, mm-hmm. mentorship, um, and just really, you know, I guess it's practice. I mean, being at meeting after meeting, it you kind of it kind of just you know you learn you learn how to cope with it a little better every time. <laughs> and when problem <laughs> and when problem and when problems arise, you know, your anxiety is a little less and less because it's like you know, uh, it's, right. I've seen it. Yeah, that's right. So. That 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 was the biggest challenge for me, but it, I'm happy it happened. I'm being I'm being honest. I mean, it's un, maybe a little bit unfortunate for the project, but I'm happy it happened in my career. Got it, got it, got it. Well, I was going to ask you about challenges you've faced, but it sounds like you kind of hit on it there. If, unless there's something else that comes to mind, it's particular to bridge engineering. Anything else come to mind? For particularly bridge engineering challenges? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah there is actually. There's so in my I mean, it's probably in in you know other other geotechnical fields as well, but there's a lot of interface with geotechnical engineers and structure engineering. Yes. Um, uh, that, that was also a challenge for me um, because, you know, you, you, it, it forces you to have a little bit knowledge about structure engineering. Mm. And I think what our group does, which is a little bit unique maybe to other geotechnical groups, uh-huh. is we actually, you know, run the group analysis. Um, uh, we, we, we do handle, uh, we are more responsible for the piles. There's, there's, there's consultants out there who maybe just may provide sole parameters and, mm-hmm. and give a, a geotechnical axial capacity or geotechnical lateral capacity and kind of step away. No, we're, we're involved a lot more. We run the group analysis. We optimize found, uh, um, pile groups, pile sizes, and so forth. Um, so it, there, that, in, uh, that forces us to really interface with the structure engineers. Mm-hmm. And I found that to be a challenge because I had to learn their language, learn what they, you know, what they're giving me and, 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 and learn how to have that conversation with them. Excellent. Excellent. All right, great. Well, before we take our break, final piece of advice you'd like to give the geotechs listening in regarding bridge engineering. I highly recommend getting into bridge engineering and I'll tell you why. Um, so I didn't mention this earlier, but I think it's clear the, our client are public, it's a public agency. So they're DOTs, BDC and, you know, these are these are taxpayer money. So you're you're typically dealing with mega mega projects. Um, I haven't been on the other side working for a pri- private client. You know, I heard I heard the pitfalls of those. You know, it's very demanding, and you know, your a private client to private client, you, you know, they have different standards, so you don't know what to expect sometimes. But working for a public, you know, work I, working for a consultant who your your owner is always a public agency, such as the DOT. I find it to be satisfying because you're working on very large jobs. Um, the budget's usually very, uh, very ample that you're allowed to, you know, go a little bit above and beyond. You know, you're not, it's not just input and output. You know, we need this tomorrow. There, there is time. There is time to look into things deeper, maybe to optimize, you know, learn about it more, run different parallel software um, to, to, to just see how, you know, it may respond in this software versus this one. So I, I think, uh, you know, that's my advice. Bridge engineering is certainly a, a, a it's a great career to be in. If you have Excellent. the opportunity, I would take it. Yeah. Excellent. I'm pretty sure you sold somebody. So that's yeah. great. <laughs> I hope so. And All come right, work great. at H and H. There you go. He's like, we're hiring, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. We're gonna come back in just a minute and close this one out with Arsenius and our career factor safety in segment. Stick around. Before we dive in, we'd like to recognize our sponsor for this episode. PPI, a leader in engineering exam prep for the FE and PE exams. PPI provides expert prep courses and study resources designed to help you pass the FE and PE exams the first time. PPI's live online courses include hours of lectures, 
problem-solving demonstrations, exam strategy sessions, office hours, and a passing guarantee. Check out PPI today at ppi2pass.com to see all the options available for FE and PE exam prep. Now let's dive into today's episode. All right, welcome back. Well, it's time for our career factor safety end segment. In geotechnical engineering, like many disciplines of engineering, it's important to incorporate a factor of safety into your design. But what about incorporating a factor of safety into your career? Today, of course, we're speaking with Arsenius Gurgis, PE, lead geotechnical engineer, uh, bridge engineer at h and H. Arsenius, you've already had a very successful career. And when you look back on your career, is there something you implement in your career to give yourself, I don't know, a factor of safety in your career? Yeah, so over my career, I found that being resourceful in geotech and engineering is, is key. Um, a, lot of ge- a lot of the answers could be found, but for geotechnical engineering, it's actually spread through a lot of different resources. It's not maybe codified as easily as it is for like structure engineering. Um, a lot of papers can offer insight on certain particular problems you may come across. Um, just being knowledgeable, FHWA has great publicate is a, has many p- geotechnical publications uh, where you can get a lot of um, uh, ways to approach a problem and a lot of uh, design information in there. So becoming really resourceful has made me actually, I think, take on more because I know exactly where to look for an answer without spending the time. And I gathered a library basically in my local drive, and I recommend this to all of my young new staff. From day one, start a library for yourself. Whatever whatever your, your papers you're reading or whatever publications come your way, store it in your own drive. Become familiar with it because if you want to really know your stuff and get an answer, you want to know where to look. You're not going to have all the answers in your head. So becoming very resourceful is going to definitely allow you to take on more. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Arsenius, thank you for coming on and for sharing all the great insights with us. Share some really good information and advice that I know is going to be helpful for our listeners. So somebody's listening or watching and wants to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to get you? You're on social media or you have an email you want to leave? Well, first, I want to thank you, Jared, for having me. It's really been a pleasure. I really enjoyed the conversation. You made it very easy to to speak about the subject. Um, I hope it's enjoyable and not too technical for people, but... um, I have LinkedIn. You can reach me on a LinkedIn LinkedIn account. I think my name is probably in in in, in this um yep, it'll be in uh, the podcast show notes. name. Okay, mm-hmm. awesome. So you can find me there. All right, great. Well, thanks for coming on. This is great. Yeah, thank you, Jared. All right, thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed the episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. Please feel free to go to geotechnicalengineeringpodcast.com where you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, that being episode 70, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. Until next time, we wish you the very best in all of your geotechnical engineering endeavors. Peace.